So welcome to today's business spotlight is with Mr. William Nolan from Adaptive. Uh, William, good morning to you. How are you? Good time, Mary Keaton. All is good here. Sure. Living the dream. Everything good. Everything good. Thank you. So for all the viewers in Action Coach in our community, can you tell them what is it you do in Adaptive? So yeah, Adaptive, we're Adaptive Design and Manufacturing. Um, so we design and manufacture products um, with metal and plastic materials. We use 3D printing technology. Um, so we use an industrial standard equipment to manufacture components for customers in any industry, any type of volume, any type of scale um, to help reduce their time to market for products um, to help them solve supply chain issues and get a more localized supply chain for their, for their products. So this is all done in Ireland, down in Cork and 3D printing. It's a fairly new industry, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, it's new to a lot of people, but it's not new to me. I've been working in the industry for <laughs> over 10 years. Um, in, in the med device industry, so it's something people probably weren't aware of that it's pretty. And you're only twenty, and you're only twenty-four. That's something to achieve. Yeah. I, tell you. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So tell me, well, who who would be a good customer? What would you describe a best customer for you? So we we say obviously the best of our customer. We we currently work in med tech, pharma, industrial, food manufacturing, automation, any of these industries. Anybody with a manufacturing process or a plant or machines or a product that's either metal or plastic. Um, so okay. it can be either a product that they're selling or a manufacturing process that they're using to manufacture a product. Um, so we look at everything from spare parts, consumable parts, custom fixtures, uh, tooling, jigs, um, right up to, I mean, sale of a product like consumer products, med devices, automotive products. These can be anything that you, that you want to sell as well. So. Fantastic. And this is right in the doorstep. You don't have to go to China or anything else to get these things. That's it. I mean, that, that's the, the whole ethos of what we're trying to set up even before COVID was even a thing. We were trying to get people to start localizing um, how they were sourcing products and to try and get away from what we call the China price as the, the whole sustainability impact of that is, is something that's really come to light now for a lot of people. But obviously with the changing circumstances with, a, with the global supply chain in the past three years, it's really showing the risks associated with people getting products from cheaper markets. So we're trying to transform how that's done. It's interesting how it's not always about price. It's sometimes you've got to add in the other logistics that come into it, which kind of change the metric altogether. That's it, because one thing yeah. we found is a lot of customers we deal with are, they'll typically have, let's say, a strategy for carbon footprint production. They might have a strategy around digitization and mm -hmm. everything we're doing is ticking boxes in all those areas for customers. So where you might be getting a product that might cost you 20 cent a piece, um, in, an, let's say, an Asian market or a far European market, even an American market, the, the impact of getting that product to your selling market or to your local base, say, if you're here in Ireland, the impact of that is quite large. Super. So, listen, we all went through COVID, the down C word. Um, what would you say one of, one of the two actions you took and they were forced to take due to the pandemic? I'd say, well, one of the things we're kind of, I'd say, forced towards is the, the, the stuff we're working on now around digitizing spare parts and components, that originally was a, a kind of a side offering for us as, as part of the business. We were focused on new product development projects, but we quickly found that the demand for that was obviously catalyzed with everything that was happening with Suez Canal, Brexit and COVID all happening mm -hmm. together. Um, and even more recently, obviously, with the Ukrainian war. So yes. we quickly took focus on what was just a side offering on a website, and that became the core business. Um, wow. And that over over a year and a half, then that just became our, our our bread and butter. Isn't that interesting? So tell me, what's the biggest learning well, that you've had since you became a business owner? Biggest learning, yeah. There's there's a big difference of of working when you're trying to maintain and sustain cash flow as opposed to just getting paid every week. That's been a huge <laughs> learning. Uh, and I think as well, especially as we went through the early days of dealing with different projects and type of customers finding out very early what the wrong customer was for us. So while a project might seem interesting, learning very quickly whether or not this was going to pay the bills long term and be scalable and repeatable. So we found that out very quickly um, of, of how to really zero in on who we needed to be dealing with. Yeah, so yeah, taking orders for orders sake doesn't always mean that you're on the right path. Yeah, interesting, you, yeah. Not to be a busy fool. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So tell me, when you were growing up, and you're very old now, obviously, when you were growing up, is this what you always wanted to do? Yeah, I always knew I'd be self-employed. Um, but in saying that, I, I did work in the industry, like I said, in the med tech industry for nearly 10 years. Um, but when I was younger, I always had the ambition that I was going to be uh, maybe in the building or construction industry or some form and, and running my own business in some make, shape or form. So 
I only looking back now when people say if you're realizing the stuff you were doing as a child that was already laying the groundwork um, yeah. of looking out for opportunities, never accepting that I couldn't do anything because I couldn't afford it. I'd always find a way. Love that. Love that. So what have been the biggest issues that you have overcome? Um, I would say the, no, the first one, but the biggest challenge was when it was just me on my own in the beginning. Uh, and obviously everything I was doing was all bootstrapped um, from the very beginning. So there wasn't a heavy investment in the beginning, so I couldn't build a team out. So trying to manage every single aspect of the business on top of the engineering side of things, mm-hmm. um, that was a huge challenge to overcome. So getting people, the right people bought in early who could come in and kind of join in with us, knowing that they were not going to be paid fully for it, basically. <laughs> okay. So getting the right team, building that team has been an important um, an important focus for you as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Like not, not just the team that are working with them, but obviously advisors, mentors, um, and obviously getting up, getting access to fundraising and things like that. So building, building a network of people that you can kind of trust to, to talk to and, and listen to that. That's a huge part of it as well. Which leads me to my next question here, which I have to ask, you know, so you, would you believe in mentoring, coaching and having people on your on your team that it, that is important to your growth? 100% because I think the biggest mistake people can make and something I was doing in the early days was getting tunnel vision and completely falling in love with your idea and not having it critiqued or, or having external eyes on it and being overprotective of what you thought it was going to be. Um, so, I mean, obviously I, I went through a startup accelerator program. I've been working with you over a number of months. And other people that have made connections with and made good relations with and having that external view is absolutely critical and it's very important that it's not friends or family interesting there yeah and i didn't pay him to say that guys i want you to know that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what have you learned most about yourself will you know, along this journey to date i yes that's a, that's an interesting one i think the most thing i've learned about myself is i suppose I'm validating my level of determination for things um, where I think what I found is when I was in industry working in kind of comfortable roles, you find yourself maybe losing that element of kind of drive and, and, and focus to get somewhere. Um, so it kind of reiterated that for me, knowing that this is exactly the way and this suits me. So whether it's good or bad, this, this is the type of thing that I like to do. I mean, you're, in, you're in a very positive way. This is great. So tell me, looking forward then now, what does the future kind of look like to you? And what do you think the most... Um, obvious challenges are that you might be facing? Well, where we're at now, obviously we're 2022 is our year that we're trying to scale as quickly as possible. So obviously we kind of started off the year and kind of still organically growing, but going a lot quicker than previous 2021 and 2020. Um, but obviously we're, we're in the fundraising mode now of getting investment and additional grant funding to try and scale up what we're doing. So that's naturally the biggest challenge we're going to have to overcome is, is securing and finalizing all the fundraising and then building out a bigger team again. Excellent, excellent. So if you were to start, or sorry, if you would talk to anybody here listening, what advice would you give to them about if they were thinking of going into business? I'm going to use the line that I've been telling to everyone, and I've been saying this for a long time. You don't do it because you like the idea of what it's going to deliver. Unless you enjoy and are willing to do what it is every single day, don't do it. So like you might like the idea of a, of a business owner. You might like You might have an idea. But unless you're willing to go through what the everyday is, yeah. if this is not a means to an end. It's if you decide to do this, you need to be sure you want to do it. Excellent. So you got to have a bit of passion involved there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, not just passion. You have to be completely obsessed. I think obsession is a good thing in this instance. Fantastic. Fantastic. There's a few movies about that where that's worked out the wrong way, but <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, look, yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a healthy balance. Um, Absolutely. Type of things, but I think that like the core of it. I mean, you have to have ultimate belief in what you want to do. I mean, because there's, there's going to be so many times you're going to be tested on it. And there has been a lot of times I've been tested on it. Um, in the early, I mean, we're only in this project about three years now. So, um, but it makes you stronger along the way, too, I think, doesn't it? It does. And, and look, look that is, for some people, that might sound like a cliche, but it does because, yeah. as you say, like the, it doesn't get easier. The problems just have more zeros on added onto them afterwards as you, as you get bigger. So here's a kind of a hard question for some people. Mm. If you were to start your business adaptive again, would you do anything differently? I think I'd probably spend, like I did a lot of time in market research and talking to customers because then I had a good network through my previous industry experience of talking to people, but I would probably spend more time validating it before going down the road of just jumping into it um, and 
taking on finance to get machines and things like that and get our production set up because I think yeah. while we were, we were actually very lucky in the environment that we were in given that it was through lockdown and COVID we were able to operate very leanly um, so we actually were very lucky in that instance and obviously we knew the whole engineering side of it inside out but I probably would have I would probably spend more time getting a, a bigger picture of what was going on out there in the market interesting okay so the future is bright for 3D printing. I see lots of stuff online about houses being built by it and all sorts of different things. So it just seems to be the opportunities, I'd imagine, must be huge looking forward. That's it. And I, like it's, it's one of those things because the industry is still in a huge rate of growth. It's still very much in its infancy. Um, it, it's taking over and being introduced into mainstream areas and a lot of industries, as I said, right up to construction of homes. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it was transforming over the last 15, 20 years in med tech aerospace and automotive but now it's people like us who are introducing it to other industries to companies who are may have not had, have the ability to access it because of the the cost of getting involved in it um but it's it's certainly changing the face of manufacturing everywhere um so we're, we're perfectly positioned to to capitalize yeah. on that well very exciting and tell me i think you mentioned what, what's the market in ireland worth in 3d printing i think you mentioned a, a figure to me some time back well, not just looking at 3D printing alone. So, I mean, like what we're looking at, um, the market we're looking at here in Ireland is a $4.8 billion market. Um, of Can I say again? Four $4.8 billion of billion. Imp yeah, of, of imported wow. components, be they're like metal or plastic parts for wow. machinery and things like that. So our goal is rather than having that imported in Ireland, we want to design and manufacture it here in Ireland. So if you could get sort of 10% uh, of that, that'd be okay for you, would it? I'm pretty okay, but we've fired, we've fired loftier ambitions to get higher. Good man. That's it, we're, to hear. We're, we're, we're going down a road of technology development now as well to keep at the forefront of what's happening with, with the technology as well. So I said we're not just a service provider, we're, we're pushing new areas that are that are going to be quite exciting when news comes out. Excellent. So, well, if any of our listeners and viewers here today would like to get in touch with you or would like to kind of find out more about with you, where, where would you guide them? Yeah, so you can go to our website, www.adaptive.com. That's A-D-D-A-P-T-I-V. It's, it's behind me there. There we um, go. Or you can email us at info at adaptive.com or directly to me at wnolan at adaptive.com. And you can get all of our information on the website. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn as well. So people can connect with me there and reach out. And um, I love talking to people about it. So I would talk all day about it if people wanted to hear about it. So reach out. Tremendous. Well, thank you so much for your time. And guys, a very interesting business and a, a disruptor, I would say, in the market coming in place, looking for a very, very bright future. So, Will, thanks for your time. Really enjoyed chatting to you and the very, very best in the future. Thanks so much for having me.